Hear the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Peace be with you. As Nate said, my name's Adam, I'm one of the pastors here, and today we're going to continue our sermon series in the book of Mark by looking at Jesus tempting in the wilderness and his proclamation of the kingdom. So before we dive into our passage today, I think it's important to be reminded of a key aspect about the wilderness that we've learned over the past couple of months. And that's this, we've learned that the wilderness is a place of testing and preparation where character is formed and built. And so through trials and through tests, we get insight into our spiritual maturity, areas of sinfulness and areas of faithfulness are revealed. And so the reality is that this has been a wilderness season for our world, for the church as a whole and for sojourn in particular. Everyone has been affected by trials in some way. Whether it's increased impact by sickness, the loss of loved ones, whether it's isolation, anger, unforgiveness, whether it's job loss or financial stress, the list really goes on. So everyone has been affected over the last couple of years. The church has uniquely been affected. And it's been both church members as well as church leaders and staff have been affected. So church members have had our regular rhythms disrupted. And some have struggled to get back into the healthy habit of regularly attending church on Sundays and regularly engaging in Christian community. Regarding church leaders, a Barna study as of October of 2021 said that 38% of pastors had contemplated quitting and getting out of the ministry within the past 12 months. And that's up from 29% just a few months earlier in January of 2021. And so things have been difficult for the church and for church leaders. Sojourn has certainly had our fair share of trials. If you think back to when we were planted in 2010, here in the Heights, a neighborhood that at the time was only 4% Bible-believing Christians, with a vision of planting churches that plant other churches, we have been under consistent opposition from the enemy since that time. And over the last couple of years, it's been particularly difficult, really with attacks coming on multiple fronts simultaneously. So, whether it started with some division amongst staff, if you guys remember the first Sunday we were here, COVID came the next Sunday and we had an extended season without being able to gather, right? We had our building next door with a freeze in Houston. I mean, when does that happen, right? We have broken pipes, unable to meet in our sojourn kids space. We have uh, sadly dismissing our lead pastor. And the most recently, a really difficult church discipline case that was painful and has affected many of you. So Sojourn, we have been in a wilderness season, not just for 40 days, but really for multiple years. And so, as we dive into our passage today, we just should recognize that this is not theoretical. This is something that we are experiencing, even though many days we may fail to realize that. But as we see in our our passage, testing precedes kingdom expansion. And so my hope is that we will be able to look back years from now and be able to see the work that God has done in and through this wilderness season. I pray that this time of testing will ultimately result in his kingdom coming in our hearts, in our neighborhood, and in our city. Before we get into the text, I'm going to pause uh, to pray once again. Father, as I sense the opposition of the enemy even now, I pray you would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
Use this time to encourage and strengthen us and to prepare us to faithfully endure whatever you have in store for us in the coming months. Guard us from distraction that we may hear a clear word from you this morning. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Amen. Now, in order to respond faithfully in times of testing, we need to be grounded in God's word. So let's turn to the scripture passage for today. As Nate read, we're in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. And Mark's account of Jesus' temptation is very brief. It's just the first two verses of our, our, our text today. Only 35 words, and it's much, much briefer than Matthew and Luke's account. However, if we look closely, there are some unique insights uh, in Mark's account. So I'm going to read through it. And then we'll make some observations. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So first, the brevity of Mark's account actually highlights the sequence of events. So what we see is that Jesus' time of testing in verses 12 to 13 occurs immediately after his baptism, which Paul preached on last week, where we see that Jesus was anointed for ministry by the Holy Spirit. And then his time of testing is followed in verses 14 through 15 by Jesus announcing his kingship, saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. So we see the order of events is noteworthy. We see anointing followed by testing and then kingship. We also see in verses 12 through 13, Mark setting the stage for an epic spiritual battle. We see Jesus driven out into the wilderness, a place of testing. And we see two sides of this battle. On one side, we see Satan and the wild animals. And on the other side, we see the Holy Spirit and ministering angels. And we see a 40-day duration, which should bring back to mind many important Old Testament events. And so there are some unique details in Mark's wilderness account there in verse 12 to 13 that I want to focus on. And they should point attentive readers back to similar times of testing in the Old Testament. So while Mark's account does point back in a way to Israel's 40 years of wandering and testing in the wilderness, and to Moses and to Elijah's 40 days on the mountain, I do think that those are actually a bit more emphasized in Matthew and Luke's account. There's some unique details, however, that show us what Mark's point of emphasis are, and I want to look at those now. We'll make some observations. We'll explore them a bit more as we go on. So the first is this. We see that the Spirit drove him out, drove Jesus out into the wilderness, Now, if you compare with Matthew and Luke's account, we see Matthew also highlights the Holy Spirit, but says that the Spirit led Jesus up into the wilderness. And we see Luke's account say that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. So some interesting language Mark chooses here to say that the Spirit drove Jesus out. We also see the repeated mention of wilderness, twice, back to back. And then we see the mention of wild animals. Now, in 15 verses, neither Matthew nor Luke mention wild animals, but Mark thinks it's important to let us know that Jesus was amongst the wild animals. So that's what we see in verses 12 and 13. If we look at verses 14 and 15, we see an emphasis on Jesus patiently awaiting his kingship. We see a couple of details here. We see first that Jesus didn't proclaim his kingship until after John was arrested and until the time is fulfilled. And so we see really three powerful connections here that should call our our attention back to a certain figure in the Old Testament. We see the order, anointing, testing, kingship. We see being driven out into the wilderness amongst wild animals. And then we see patiently waiting to be king. And so who is Mark drawing our attention to? Well, I think it's clearly David. And we will see that as we look more closely at the life of David. So by pointing back to King David, Mark is emphasizing that Jesus is the long-awaited king, the son of David, who is finally here. So I'll structure the sermon today under three points. 
And that's testing prepares for kingship. Also, testing progresses throughout kingship. And then third, testing's prevalence in kingdom life. So first, let's look at how testing prepares for kingship by looking closer at these three connections to the life of King David. So we see in David's life the order of anointing followed by testing. We see this as we're introduced to David in 1 Samuel 16. We see David comes onto the scene after God has rejected King Saul for his disobedience. The spirit leaves Saul and Samuel comes, lays his hand upon David, anoints him with oil and the Holy Spirit comes upon David. And we see immediately following this that David too experiences testing. We see that Jesus is anointed with the spirit and is tested and the same thing takes place with David. Just in the next chapter, we see David's first test of preparation. And this is a familiar story. It's David and Goliath where we see David trusting God amidst fear. Now David's test here parallels Jesus' testing in the wilderness. We see a few things that highlight that. First, Goliath taunts Israel for 40 days. We also see David, a young shepherd boy who has fought off wild animals to protect the sheep and he is the only one courageous enough to face Goliath. We actually see Goliath himself described in a sense as a Satan-like figure or a seed of the serpent. We see that he's of the Philistines and the Philistines actually means dust rollers. And we see Goliath's armor and we see his, his breastplate described as a breastplate of scales, which is interestingly serpent-like. And then at the end, what happens? David defeats Goliath by crushing the, his head, which points back to God's promise in Genesis 3, that the seed of the serpent would crush the seed, excuse me, that the seed of the woman, an important distinction, would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And so Jesus by resisting temptation in the wilderness, shows that he will ultimately be the faithful one who crushes Satan himself. Now David has another test of preparation that follows a few chapters later in 1 Samuel 24. We see an encounter with Saul where David is enticed with ascending to the throne prematurely. So here David's test demonstrates his patience in waiting to be king. We see a harmful spirit has come upon Saul is tormenting him and is, in a way, causing him to regularly seek to kill David. And so as a result, David is driven out into the wilderness. We see David and his men actually hiding in a location called Wild Goats Rocks, which hopefully you can see the connection there to wild animals. And Saul comes into the cave alone to relieve himself. And David's men tempt him, saying... The Lord has given your enemy into your hand. So what does David do? He resists the enticement to ascend to the throne prematurely. Instead, he patiently waits. He recognizes that Saul remains the king of Israel. And so we see in our passage today that Jesus too patiently waited for the time to be fulfilled, to begin his kingship. And so both David and Jesus are anointed by the Spirit. They're they're faithful as they're tested in the wilderness, and they patiently wait to begin their kingship. Now we've seen how testing prepared David and Jesus for kingship, but God also uses trials to prepare someone for life under Jesus' kingship. To those of you here today that are not yet followers of Jesus, God uses trials in your life many times to help you realize that the things you're putting your hope in are ultimately not going to satisfy and to help you recognize you're not really in control of your life. A C.S. Lewis quote, quote helps highlight this. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So if you've been experiencing trials and hardships, consider that perhaps this is a word from God calling you at your attention and drawing you to Jesus. Perhaps he's even brought you here this morning for that reason. And for those who are Christians in the room, just think back to your time and your testimony, time before you followed Jesus, 
Many times, God has used difficulties in your life to help you come to the point of recognizing your need for a Savior. So while testing prepares for kingship, what we'll see is that the testing does not stop there. So let's move to our second point, which is this, that testing progresses throughout kingship. Testing progresses throughout kingship. So Jesus' time of testing did not end after 40 days in the wilderness. It continued throughout his ministry, culminating when Jesus willingly went to the cross. Similarly for David, his tests were just beginning. So shortly after Saul dies, David becomes king of Israel. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and he continues to be tested. His first kingly test is another familiar one, where we see David enticed by Bathsheba. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. So we see David at home when he should have been out at battle, goes out onto the rooftop and he sees Bathsheba bathing. He sends for her and he sleeps with her. So this is an obvious failing of this test of enticement. David has coveted his neighbor's wife and then committed adultery with her. We see a few chapters, excuse me, immediately afterwards, we see his second test, and that is his fear of his sin being discovered. So Bathsheba informs David that she's pregnant, and David is faced with a choice. Should he cover up his sin, or should he confess his sin? Well, he decides to call Bathsheba's husband home from battle. But thinking of his fellow soldiers... Uriah refuses to sleep with Bathsheba. And so David eventually orders the army to leave Uriah on the front lines to be killed. And so, in order to cover up his initial sin, David, sadly, commits an even more grievous sin. So how can David, an adulterer and murderer, be called a man after God's heart? Well, it's because of how he responded to his sin, to his failed test. And he responds with heartfelt obedience. See, David cannot hide his sin from everyone. He cannot hide his sin from God. And so God sends Nathan the prophet to confront David in his sin. And David's repentance is shown in great detail in Psalm 51. So as an aside, if you're, whether you're a Christian or not, I would encourage you, if you are caught up in sin... Or if you're seeking to cover up sin, go and read Psalm 51 and ask God to show you how you too can repent. So what was ultimately at stake in David's testing and in Jesus' testing? Well, David represented Israel as their king. So the consequences of David's sin not only affected him and his family, they also affected the entire nation of Israel. Even more significantly, with Jesus, the salvation of the world literally hung in the balance on Jesus perfectly passing this first test in the wilderness and passing every test thereafter. See, on the cross, Jesus died the death that is deserved by all those who fail their tests. And those who repent and believe are credited with Jesus' faithfulness. So to summarize, whereas David proved to be an unrighteous king, he chose to satisfy his own desires, even sacrificing someone else by putting them to death. But yet Jesus laid down his own desires, even to the point of death, demonstrating himself to be a perfectly righteous and self-sacrificing king. And so, hopefully after that time looking at the life of David, it's clear that Mark was intentionally comparing Jesus to David, and by drawing readers' attention to the imperfections of David, we highlight the perfections of our Savior, of Jesus. And so, it is good news that the kingdom of God is at hand, because Jesus is the type of king that we all need, and that we all should want. So since Jesus passed every test perfectly and defeated Satan, what is the place of testing in the life of the Christian? We're going to move to point three, which is testing's prevalence in kingdom life. So, should we expect to be tested? 
Well, 1 Peter 4.12 makes it fairly clear. It says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. See, throughout the scriptures, God has always tested his people, and we should not think that we will be exempt from this testing. So what's at stake in our testing? Well, thankfully, the salvation of the world is not at stake in our testing. And I would say for those who are in Christ, our salvation is actually not at stake in our testing. But our tests are still quite significant. See, through testing, our true character is revealed and we get an honest look at who and what we love most and who and what we fear most. See, our small earthly battle is actually part of a bigger cosmic battle. We see this in Ephesians 6, verse 12. It says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so, though Jesus decisively defeated Satan on the cross, and Jesus reigns at God's right hand, what we see is that Satan will not go down without fighting. He'll continue fighting until Jesus returns in glory, continuing to oppose God's people and God's kingdom. So, our salvation is not contingent on whether we pass every test, but I would say that our salvation is revealed in how we respond after testing. See, if we remain faithful, our salvation is revealed when we praise God and we give him the glory. If we fail, our salvation is revealed when we seek God. See, when we fail, we respond by repenting, by turning away from our sin and turning back to God. And we respond by meditating upon the gospel and believing the gospel. See, we're to confess our sin to God and to others, and this practice will help us move beyond worldly sorrow into true repentance where we can experience life transformation. So, let's look at verse 14 and 15 and look at the good news that Jesus speaks of. So, Jesus followed his testing by proclaiming the gospel of God, or literally pro proclaiming the good news of God. Gospel means good news. So the good news that Jesus was proclaiming here was simply that the kingdom of God is at hand. God in Christ reigns as king, and the long-awaited king is here. Now, as Mark's gospel unfolds, we'll see the good news in greater clarity. As we see, King Jesus proves faithful in every test and ultimately dies to redeem his people. So in light of the gospel... I want to end our time by focusing on three aspects of good news related to our testing as Christians. So the first piece of good news is that God is in control of our testing. So who initiated Jesus' time of testing? Well, if we look back at verse 12, clearly the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness. So God initiated Jesus' time of testing, and God initiates our testing. But God does not tempt us, right? Satan is clearly the one who is tempting. And so James 1, verses 13 through 14, helps clarify this. It says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And so how does Satan lure us and entice us by our own desires? Well, we see in the scriptures, I'd say, two primary strategies. We see these play out in the life of David. The first is this, Satan entices us by our fleshly desires. We saw this in the life of David, where he is enticed to seize the throne early, and he is enticed by Bathsheba. We see a second strategy of Satan, and that is threatening our deepest fears. We see this also play out in the life of King David, where he is threatened by Goliath's taunts, and he's also threatened that his adultery would be revealed. So in addition to these two primary strategies, I want to highlight two primary approaches that Satan takes. So those two approaches are direct on the one hand 
and then disguised and deceitful on the other hand. See, Satan takes a direct approach at times and a powerful approach when he has a stronghold. As I reflect back on areas where I have had past sin patterns, where at one point the enemy had a stronghold, there are times when I can literally feel the temptation of Satan rising up in my gut. I can feel it. It's not disguised. It's a direct, powerful attack. But most commonly, particularly here in America, Satan tends to take a disguised and deceitful approach. See, Satan is described in the scriptures as an angel of light. He's disguised. He's also described as the father of lies. He's deceitful. And so typically in the U.S., that is Satan's approach. And so sadly, one reason that we often fail testing is because we don't realize we're being tested at all until it's too late. I'll say this, even over the past few weeks, when I agreed to preach a sermon on Jesus being tempted in the wilderness, I recognized that I was likely going to be tested during this, this few weeks coming up to it. I even talked with my wife about it. And yet, it's been frustrating at how we were still unable to see when these attacks came. And so, so Satan takes a direct approach and he takes a disguised or deceitful approach. So I'd like to encourage us to counter Satan's approach and his strategies by actually changing our approach to life and coming up with our own strategies. See, our daily approach to life should actually be to adopt a wartime mentality, always being on guard against spiritual attacks. Additionally, we should have strategies to fight temptation, and I'll outline two of those here in a bit. So we also see that God equips us for the battle. God's in control, and he equips us for the battle. We see this in Ephesians 6, verse 11, which says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So whether the enemy is enticing you by fleshly desires, or threatening your deepest fears, whether he's taking a direct approach, or whether he's taking a disguised and deceitful approach, we can be strong in the Lord and stand firm, empowered by the Holy Spirit and holding fast to God's word and seeking God in prayer. And as we resist the enemy in God's strength, we see the scriptures promise that he will flee from us. And so in conclusion, often God tests us by allowing the enemy to tempt us, but he's always in control. He's always restraining what the adversary is permitted to do, and he always equips us for battle. Let's look at the second piece of good news as it relates to our testing. And that's this. God enables us to endure common and escapable temptations. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It should be on, me, on the screen behind me. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. See, temptations are common. Whatever temptation you may personally encounter and struggle with, it is not unique. Think back to the temptations we looked at in David's life. These were common, right? Temptations to fear, impatience, sexual immorality, covering up of sin, so while your temptations may be different than your friends or those in your parish, don't believe the lie that your temptations are uniquely difficult. All of our temptations are in a way common. We also see that our temptations are escapable. While we may not always recognize it in the moment, God is always providing a way of escape for us when we are tempted. For example, David had multiple ways of escape when he was trying to cover up his sin with Bathsheba. But rather than confessing his sin to Uriah or to others, instead he arranged for his murder. And so I'll say, as I reflect back on my life, some of the most regrettable things are when I can see that God had provided a way of escape, and yet I willfully did not take it. We also see that we are able to endure temptations. So I think it's important to note that temptation itself is not sin. 
See, Jesus was clearly tempted in the wilderness, and yet the scriptures are abundantly clear that Jesus never sinned. And so, I highlight that because there should be no shame in being tempted. There should not even be any shame in how you're being tempted. But the enemy wants you to feel embarrassed or ashamed just for the fact that you're being tempted, so that you'll try to fight your battle alone. And so one strategy is to not fight temptation alone. See, Jesus had the spirit and ministering angels with him while he was being tested in the wilderness. He also had his disciples with him when he was in Gethsemane, about to go to the cross. And, and they were there to pray for him when they were not falling asleep. Uh, so I say this to say we should ask our community to help us fight temptation. Now, just like the disciples failed, our community is not perfect. They are not going to be the answer, and we cannot seek them as the primary means to fight temptation. But God may be providing your community as a way of escape. So engage people in your parish. Maybe it's just a couple of of men or women that you trust, depending on what you're talking about. Engage your roommate, a spouse, a close friend, and ask them to help you in your temptations. Share what you're experiencing, how you're prone to temptation, and how you're being tempted currently. And I'll say this, when you ask someone to pray for you, they'll, they'll speak words of encouragement and love, and God uses their prayers. So, because God equips us for battle, and because we're not alone, we're able to endure temptations. And I'll actually say this, even in the last 48 hours, as I meditated upon what I was prepared to preach and started to see the enemy's attacks for what they are, I've actually seen that play out and then it feels like the enemy has fleed and that is encouraging. And there's been a lot of people praying for me and I'm appreciative for that. So let's turn to the final piece of good news related to our testing and that is this that Jesus sympathizes and helps in our time of need. Let's look at Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. It says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, if we think Jesus only faithfully resisted temptation by leveraging his deity, then honestly, we're going to struggle to think that Jesus sympathizes with us in our testing. See, as Paul highlighted last week, Jesus is fully God, and he's fully man, but yet he emptied himself He emptied himself of certain aspects of his divine nature, taking on humanity, and therefore his temptations were real and difficult. See, if Jesus was leveraging his deity to resist temptation, then why is Mark highlighting the spirit and the ministering angels that come alongside Jesus to help him fight? Or how could Jesus sympathize with our weakness if he had not emptied himself? So, Rather than Jesus not understanding the depths of our temptations, I think it's better to say that we do not understand the depths of Jesus' temptation, and that's because we have not resisted like him. I have another C.S. Lewis quote that I think is helpful here. He says, Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. And so Jesus has experienced more difficult temptations than you and I have. And yet, by the power of the Spirit and by the ministering angels, he remained faithful And because this is true, we can draw near to Jesus and we can trust that he really sympathizes with us in our temptation. And and he is ready to help in our time of need. So I want to highlight a second strategy to fight temptation. 
and that's to draw near to Jesus through fasting. Now, we haven't looked at Matthew and Luke's account, but in both of their accounts, we see that Jesus fasted for 40 days while he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. See, fasting can help attune us to the spiritual battle we're immersed in and remind us that the Lord sustains us and strengthens us. Through fasting, we draw near to Jesus. We receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. And so therefore, I think it's an appropriate response when being tested to fast. I know that's not a common practice in America today. So I actually want to challenge all of us who are able to join together this week in an appointed time for a church-wide fast. Now, we'll send out an email with details, and I would just ask you to prayerfully consider it. Prayerfully consider joining us. Ask God to help us endure this wilderness season and to keep us faithful. So in closing, honestly, many of us are discouraged. It's been a long season of testing. For some of us, it feels like this wilderness season is never going to end. So as we end our time today, I want us to meditate upon the reality that everything, all of our wickedness, all of our sin, all of our regrets, all of our shame, all of our failed tests have been dealt with by Jesus. None of this has been outside of God's control, and no tests will be outside of God's control. And our King Jesus, who perfectly passed every test and resisted every temptation, he sympathizes with us, he's sustaining us, and he stands ready to help in our time of need. So turn to Jesus. Trust him. He will keep us faithful amidst testing, and he will empower us to continue to proclaim and build God's kingdom even amidst testing. Please pray with me. God, we thank you that you hear those who cry out to you, that you care deeply for your people. We cry out to you today, weary from this long season of testing. Many of us are frustrated by the sinfulness we have come to see in our hearts and in the hearts of others. Many of us are wounded and need your grace to help us heal and forgive. And while we're eager for this wilderness season to end, we pray that you would enable us to rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that your word says that suffering produces endurance, that leads to character, that leads to hope. Even when we are discouraged, by your grace, Lord, give us hope. Remind us that you work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purposes. And remind us that sharing in the sufferings of our Savior prepares us for glory. Sustain us and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.